Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church here at LCR. We are back in action, meaning we are back in the church, but you're also able to join us online. And whether you're online at home still or whether you're able to come to the church, we're so glad that you're here. It is a reminder that now that we're back in session, Jamie's put together a really cool program uh, for kids from preschool to fifth grade so that they can uh, be in a program during service, parents can be in church, and it's just another way that we can provide support during this time. We did want to remind you the LCR app is available, so you can download that from the App Store. It's LCR space HB, and that has videos, it has Bible study links, it has prayer requests, it has our uh, Lenten online devotional, and already if you went in there, you could see the tribute video for Gordon Rosen's funeral this afternoon, which is at 2.30. So we're hoping that it's going to be just a cool way to connect you to the life of the church, and we're so glad that you're here in worship as we join our hearts together in praise. Good morning. Welcome back, everybody. Psalm 25 says, Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, remember O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love. For you are merciful, O God. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. Would you stand as we begin our worship? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. Behind your regrets and mistakes, come today. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to. The altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. For oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with. 
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Let us pray. We come before your altar, O God, and we bring ourselves, especially in this season of the year, we bring those things in us that are dry or deserted or no longer alive or we've been trod down and no growth is possible. We bring all these things and we offer them to you, trusting in your goodness, trusting in your love, and asking for your blessing. We worship you, God, worthy of praise. And may you take all that we have and make us alive in your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Chapter 9. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, God said. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel is from Mark chapter 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn, torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel. Please be seated. Well, it's so good to see uh, people back in the church. It's the first time in a long time that we've been inside. We've been online. We've been outside. We've been all over. And you'll notice we've compressed the service a little bit um, just in light of having people in here. So you'll notice just a few changes musically and other things. Um, and that just is out of caution. Um, you'll notice the great dumpster in the parking lot, the great Lutheran dumpster in the parking lot. And if only it were purple for Lent, you know, then we could have it be a symbol. Um, but, you know, we're cleaning things out here. So just every once in a while, you just have to go and go into the backyard and go into cabinets and rooms. So the dumpster's full of stuff that we either didn't need anymore, uh, we got and probably never needed, or we got it and used it well, and it's time to retire it. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we actually donated to another church in Garden Grove that they'll continue using in church. Now, why am I spending all this time talking about the dumpster? Not because I'm proud of it. I'm a little proud of it, but not that proud of it. Um, is if you have something big at your house that you've been waiting to throw away because you're like, well, that's not going to pick up or whatever, now's your time. Probably the next day or two, the dumpster will still be here. There's room. 
you know, throw it away. Now, I have to tell you the same thing they tell you at Goodwill. If you can't get it in the dumpster, don't leave it here. Not that you would. No one in here, maybe someone online, no one in the room here would do that. Um, or if you're not sure, go ahead and talk to me. I know like um, someone whose 92-year-old grandmother has a, a mattress in her garage. She goes, oh, I'd love to get that out of her garage. So we'll pick it up, we'll get her box spring and something perfect, throw it in the dumpster. So this is your chance, Lutherans, to clean out. Uh, let that be a symbol, of your, um, a symbol of your own Lenten work, the great dumpster in the parking lot. So I mentioned it already, uh, the LCR app is available. Um, you can access a lot of material on that. You can access our um, daily devotional, five days a week. I send out something on the small catechism just to remind you of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, baptism and communion. Um, also, you can get notifications for the school or youth or whatever, so you can configure that however you want. Um, let's see. There's two other things I want to say. One I'm going to say in the sermon, but then the other I'll say now, which is, as you know, today at 2.30, we're doing Gordon Rosen's funeral here in the courtyard that will be available on Zoom. If you would like to see the video tribute that his family has made, they made a beautiful video that's already in the app, in the media section, and you can watch that video. Good. Val, I think that's it. That's all I have to say. That's it. Just a string of announcements. Um... Well, if you were here on Wednesday, or if you were watching online on Wednesday, it was Ash Wednesday, and we talked about the prophet Joel. And we talked about how Joel said, look, everybody, you all have work to do in this business of return, whether you're a baby, whether you're at the end of your life, whether you're sick, you're healthy, you're about to get married, you're at business, you're in a meeting, everybody, time out, stop. We all have to get together now. Humans, unite and do this work of returning to God. And the prophet Joel gave us this wonderful image where he said, don't tear your clothes, a traditional sign of mourning, like tearing your clothes, just rending your garments. He goes, tear open your heart. So this is the season of heart tearing, opening hearts, and seeing what happens when we give our torn hearts to God and what God might do with them. Well, it gets even bigger than that today. If you listen to what Val read, Val reads the great moment in Genesis when the flood has ended. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the Bible or, I mean, every culture in the world has this sort of prehistoric cultural imprint of a time in which the world was flooded. And so in the Bible story, after that period, God comes and goes, all right, look, we've had this time of renewing the earth, this flood, and it's time to make a covenant. Now, if you know about God's covenant making, which is like a contract, but it's more than a contract, it has a deeper level of commitment and loyalty to it. God says, we're going to make a, a covenant with all the people, and the people are like, all right. And then he goes, and we're going to bring in the birds, we're going to bring in the cats, the dogs, the dolphins, the pigs, ev everyone. Literally every creature that will be on the earth, I'm going to make this promise to them. So this is, there's a few times in the Bible where God will make promises to everyone, literally every creature on earth, with this idea of saying that they all have a stake in the wholeness and health of the planet, the ecosystem of wherever they live on the planet. And so that this covenant of the rainbow is meant to be a covenant for everyone. So like you can look at it and go, oh look, it's a rainbow, how pretty. And then like a dolphin can look at it and have some sense of like, oh look, a rainbow. I think they have big brains, so they probably think that. Uh, we were listening to a podcast the other week, uh, and they were talking to an entomologist, I think an entomologist, someone who deals with bugs, and uh, they said, what would your world of bugs say about God? And they said, well, God must love beetles. God's made some, there's more beetles on earth than any other creature in terms of variety of species and distinctions and other things. So the guy goes, well, if there's a God, then God must love beetles. So whether it's the dolphins, the beetles, the dogs, the cats, the people, this thing that Val read was a promise and a limit that violence would no longer threaten to undo the earth. That's what's at stake. Why is it so important for God to call together all the creatures of the earth? Because human violence was at the root of undoing the creation the first time. So, if you read the chapters before this, Noah and the flood, sometimes we read those with a kind of judgment. We look at them and we go, gosh, God is like, so, why is God so upset? And why is God so mean? And oh, God's having a bad day, so God's going to flood the earth. It's such a funny, it's a funny perspective that we take because, of course, it puts us in the seat of moral superiority to God, which is a common human problem. 
we would never walk into a hospital where someone's having a bone marrow transplant, where their body's literally being killed almost to the point of death. They're hoping to kill somebody to bring them back and reset their, literally, the thing that generates their blood and their bones and the marrow and say, oh, these people are so mean to you. How could they be so mean resetting your body like this? We would go, oh, I hope this works. I'm praying for you. Can I bring your family food? Oh, my gosh. You know, oh, I'm so glad we have this technology that we can do something like this. What I mean by that is the effect of human violence on the earth in the early chapters of Genesis is so significant that God has to literally give the world a kind of bone marrow transplant. Except in this case, it's almost just an exterior washing like, look, we're going to have to just save a little bit of this, reset it, and try again. But the promise of the rainbow and the promise of this covenant is to say, I'm going to give you a reminder that no matter how bad things get, human violence will not threaten to undo the earth again. And thank God, get, thank God, God gave us that promise, because uh, I'm not sure we would have made it through the 20th century. You know, World War I and the trenches and the gas, World War II, the death camps and the fighting, uh, Joseph Stalin starving the Ukraine, Mao Zedong starving China. Come, come here. I mean, if we made it through the 20th century, the rainbow is a pretty strong promise that human violence will not undo the earth again. So if God makes this promise and God continues to shine this promise, then what is the work or what is the antidote to the problem that remained, which was, even though the earth got washed, at the heart and at the marrow, things were still the same. Some of the same defects or some of the same defective genes were still replicating in the human spirit. Well, that's why we have this first Sunday of Lent, and we always read the same thing. We read the temptation of Jesus. But you all got a little break today because the temptation of Jesus is usually a longer story about, you know, he goes and they say, oh, he's so hungry, turn the stones into bread. He goes up on the temple, they go, and he, Satan wants him to worship him. We have this whole dramatic story in the other Gospels that we don't have here. Mark is very concise in his language. The Gospel of Mark said he went to get baptized, he got baptized. He went out to the desert, he got tempted, and then he came back. And then John the Baptist got arrested, and then he started his work. It's like John the Baptist, or Mark, the writer of the gospel, is compressing all the details so that he can get to the proclamation of the good news. That Jesus himself will become the sign of covenant that human violence will not undo the creation in the earth. Jesus becomes the rainbow that shines in the wilderness. So Val gave you, in a very short reading, what in the other gospels are chapters, whole chapters of material and information. Now, we don't get any of those details. And if I hadn't prepared a sermon, like if I'd just woken up going, oh my gosh, I didn't pre pre prepare anything today, I would have uh, just gone, well, you know, in the other Gospels, and then I would have just walked through that, burned out the time, and then you go, well, that, that wasn't what Val read, but I guess it was interesting that he said that. So just, sometimes preachers do that. If we don't prepare, we just go, well, I know we had this, but let me tell you about this. Sort of it's like a magician deflecting. I didn't do that. Hopefully you see I didn't do that. Not today. Maybe another Sunday I'll do it. But. but Mark doesn't say any of that. What Mark says is Jesus went into the desert. He was tempted, and he was tempted. And that temptation is to say that God and God's way of restoration and healing and wholeness is somehow a lie or just less appealing than the alternative, which is a world whose catalyst is violence. And then he's with the wild beasts. That's an interesting little line that Mark throws in there. He was with the wild beasts. Because the thing that's supposed to be ringing in our heads is that Jesus is like the new Adam. So the first Adam was in the garden with the wild beasts. And there was a sense of wholeness and proportion and harmony and belonging and so on. And by the time the second Adam comes, which is Jesus, there is no garden, there's a desert. There's a space where nothing can grow. There is not a kind of sense of wholeness and healing and belonging. There's a sense of alienation and dryness. The, if you've ever been out in the desert, like I grew up in the desert in Arizona, you know, the sense of if you don't have water, you get disoriented. If you get disoriented, you get dehydrated. If you get dehydrated, you might die in the desert. The desert is a threatening place where life cannot flourish unless it's adapted to the, to the dryness of the place, scorpions, rattlesnakes, and the like. But you're not like, oh, I hope we get to see a scorpion or a rattlesnake today. 
When Jesus goes into the wilderness, he is the second Adam returning to the garden made a desert. And when he's with the beasts, he's giving us a hint that God's business that began with the rainbow is going to continue even farther, that now we don't just have a limit to the destruction of the environment through human violence. And when I mean the environment, I mean the entire ecosystem of existence. But in fact, we have the inkling of a restoration. Jesus is the rainbow coming to be an inkling of restoration. And it is no mistake that the mission he has is the cross because the cross will be the ultimate example of human violence to silence God, which is murder. An innocent man is murdered. And the idea will be, what does God do with that? Will that undo the world? You know, Jesus said that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes, look, if I wanted, remember, he's like the commanding general of the angels. He's like Prince Harry before Harry had all his titles taken from him, you know, in terms of the royal, the royal attache to the military. And so he goes, look, if I wanted to, I could end this right now. But that's not why I came. I didn't come here to end it. I came to renew it. And so Jesus takes the cross and he uses it as an occasion to bring about the healing that even the flood couldn't bring, which is no longer now just an exterior washing. We have to get to the human heart and start to renew that. If we think the soil of the desert's bad, just wait till God deals with the poisonous soil of the human heart. I've shared this story probably, I usually share it once a year, maybe more than once a year. Um, there's a very famous video, and maybe it's not famous because you may have never heard of it. So there's a video, um, and it was one of, the, one of the Jewish resistance fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto, and he'd become an alcoholic later in his life because of everything he'd experienced. And he's talking to an interviewer, and they wouldn't let them film him because they didn't want to embarrass his legacy because he had become kind of so debilitated by alcoholism. And he's saying to the interviewer, he goes, if you could lick my heart, it would poison you. That's just such a powerful line. If you could lick my heart, it would poison you. There's a poison deep inside. Uh, and he knows there's something kind of festering out of him because of what he's experienced and seen and done. And so how does God deal with that? So God needs more than a rainbow to deal with that, which is why we get the cross. There is a curious verse in the New Testament and it's the only place, there's only one place where we talk about this, where they say, what did Jesus do after the cross when he died, when he's dead? Where did, what was he doing? You know, in the creed, we always say he descended into hell. He descended to the dead. What was he doing? And Peter, in one of his letters, it's only just a few verses, and it's an alternate reading for today. He says that Jesus went down to the souls that were in prison and he preached to them. From the time of Noah, they had been disobedient and he came and he preached his good news to them. So when Jesus even goes to hell after the cross, he is going to hell to break up the dry ground of that desert and to bring forth the people who need the gift of his good news. There are places where rainbows do not shine because they are so dark. There are places where the rain never falls because they are so dry and the good news of Jesus is sent to penetrate that. And what I want to challenge you with today, if Jesus can go to hell and preach good news, if Jesus can go to hell and share the gift of that rainbow, then you can too in Huntington Beach. You don't even have to go to hell unless you feel like Huntington Beach is hell, but I hope you don't. Well, we probably have a few corners. Uh, if Jesus can do that, so can you. And why am I saying that to you? Because to Peter in that same passage, he tells them, he says, the flood of Noah was just a prefiguring of baptism. He goes, so if you want to know, when did God deal with your heart, even if it's a poisonous heart, he dealt with it in your baptism. When was God going to bring the good news of his cross and resurrection to your, uh, to your place of death? Well, he did that in his cross and resurrection in your baptism. How was God going to manage your violence? He did that with your baptism. And your baptism means that you've been given the vocation of being, like Christ, a rainbow, a sign that you will not participate in the undoing of creation through your way of life, but simultaneously that your life will be a preaching of good news about what God has accomplished through the cross and through Easter. That's why on that Holy Saturday, which is right before Easter, we talk about the harrowing of hell, which is an agricultural term of breaking up the ground. 
My wife and I were watching a show about Victorian farming, because that's where we are in life now, is watching shows about Victorian farming. Uh, but you know, they're dragging this huge implement on the ground to break it up so that things can grow again. The whole point of the gospel is for God to say, I am going to grow things where you thought it wasn't possible, where the ground has been so barren and destroyed uh, that you thought there was no life. It is the Roman definition of peace that the Romans would go in, destroy a city, kill the people, kill the men, women, and children, sell the rest into slavery, get rid of the animals, salt the ground, and then they'd come back to the desert and go, look, we made peace. Well, you made peace by getting rid of all the life. That's death. That was the Roman version of peace was a version of death. God's peace is a kind of life that flourishes. That's why I think God made that covenant with all the animals, all the birds, the beetles, the bees, the people, was to say your vocation, which is your calling and your work, is to help participate in the power of Christ, which is the power of life that flourishes. I told you on Ash Wednesday that on Friday we were going to do our first pilot program. We're doing a pilot program with a nonprofit in the county. We're working with Huntington Beach EMS. Uh, in fact, the, the battalion chief of Huntington Beach EMS went to high school with Cassie. He's sitting here. So it's funny to see them. And she's giving a wave. Uh, but it was so great for people who have lived in this city a long time. They all know each other. He lives in our neighborhood here. His kids went to preschool here. He went to a youth group meeting 25 years ago in Burkha Hall. You know, so there are all these overlaps of people who have lived in Huntington Beach. And they set up essentially like their emergency little triage section. Um, and they had a nurse who had identified a number of homeless folks uh, who needed wounds washed and tended. And that's what they did in the parking lot. They washed wounds. They evaluated them. They talked about ways that we can collaborate in this part of our city so that we can deal, as I said on Ash Wednesday, let the police deal with the criminality of it. You know, let the navigation center and some of the, the larger city programs provide a space for people. But what about those people who are still in the cracks, who are vulnerable, and there is no place for them to go and to be sent? Well, let a couple of them come to our parking lot and have their wounds washed, and then for the ones that need it, be sent to a hotel, and for the ones that need it, to get medical care and individualized treatment so that they can begin to experience in their bodies, the literal soil of their bodies, the flourishing that we're talking about with the kingdom of God. It is our particular vocation of this church to be a leader of and a participant in healing for our city. Part of its bodies, part of its discourse, part of its neighbors, part of its reconciling enemies. There's so much that fits into this, but it fits into that vocation of being that sign, the covenantal sign of the rainbow, the covenantal sign of the shell and water of baptism, the covenantal sign of Eucharist. All of these hints that God's given the world to say, the world will not be undone by your violence. In fact, the world is being remade by my love. And you are becoming an important part of God's remaking, the real visible signs of God's presence in our city here. And for the stuff that we discover that we don't need, throw it in the dumpster. That's the whole point of Lent. There's stuff that we are feeding and participating in, cultivating that we don't need. It's not contributing to the wholeness. Throw it in the dumpster, get rid of it. Create more space for the ground to be broken and to life and for life to flourish. Amen. We now confess our faith and during Lent we use the Nicene Creed. So let us now confess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and the kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us join our hearts together now in prayer, knowing that God delights in hearing us and growing new things in us, breaking ground for life to flourish. Almighty God, you know the poison taste of our hearts, those things that fester and move in us that are hidden or dark, those things that um, we find ourselves even trying to resist but powerlessly. And so we thank you for the mission of your Son to penetrate the earth and to get to the heart and to bring renewal, to bring hope and life that flourishes. Oh God, we pray for every place on the earth threatened by violence. We pray for ways that we are complicit in that, for the undoing of your gifts is what I'm saying. And may we be um, ambassadors of the peace that you bring, which is a peace that touches everyone you made that promise with, from the smallest to the largest, from the smartest to the least. For every creature that you've made, to experience the fullness of life that you desire for your creation. The Lord, in the same way your son was tempted, tempted away from following you, tempted away from the mission of your cross, grant that we may not be tempted away from hard things for your sake. Grant that we may take risks on your behalf. We pray for those in our congregation who are in need of your care, for those who are undergoing treatment for cancer, especially Gary Durica, for those who are recovering from long COVID and the effects of long COVID, for those who have loved ones that they cannot attend to because of distance in hospitals, especially CAT. We pray for those who will be gathering this afternoon to commend Gordon to your care. May you bless all those who grieve and may you take that grief and fold it into your promise of new life. We pray for the mission of your church, O oh Lord, that you might purify us, that we might throw into the unholy dumpster all those things that keep us from taking seriously the call of discipleship, but that we, almost, that we also might be ambassadors of healing, of washing, of tending, like the Good Samaritan finding a stranger in the road, tending, washing, providing, so that they can discover wholeness too. Grant, O oh Lord, that you might guide our steps and that we might be faithful and that whether it's our fasting, our prayer, or our works of mercy and sharing of wealth with others, that it might be something that helps in the transforming of the earth. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.
So if you have your items for communion, this would be the time to open them and prepare them. And when we think of the signs that God has given us, like the rainbow or the waters of baptism, this becomes a primary sign too, that even though he's about to be the victim of the cross, even though he's about to be murdered, Jesus still offers this gift of reconciliation before and after the event as a way of healing. So even though the bread and the wine goes into our stomachs, the grace goes into our hearts. So in the way your stomach's going to digest the bread and the wine, your, stomach, your heart is going to be digesting grace. It's been said across the history of the church, unlike every other meal you eat that you turn into yourself, like a hamburger turns into my nails and my skin and my hair, this meal turns you into it. The grace of Christ turns you into the body of Christ for the sake of the world. So this is a transformational moment that I just want us to be aware of, that something so small can accomplish something so great. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who come to his supper. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus, your spirit in us is a wellspring of life everlasting. Well up in us the living water that breaks through the parched earth of our hearts, that it might refresh us and wash us, but that it might also refresh our neighbor and wash them, that it might even water our enemies and those that we do not trust. Let this be a gift for everyone we meet. Well, in up, well up in us the holiness of life, and we ask this in your name. Amen.
Well, we're so glad that you were able to join us for worship today. Like I said, the Lutheran dumpster is here if you need it. Do your Lenten cleansing and also do your Lenten work of being a presence of healing and hope in the world. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.